to send a clear message to the public and people in their kingdoms. Kings and queens would sentence many people to death. Many traitors in England had their heads placed above London Bridge, so that thousands of people each day would get the idea not to cross their ruler. Henry VIII, for example, even had some of his closest friends and two of his wives executed, and these people brought great shame upon their family once killed. They lost their titles and wealth, and because of this the crown inherited it all. But there was one form of public shame and humiliation, which was used to send a clear message to the people of the lands, and it was known as a posthumous execution. This is where, to hammer home the shame that these people brought, they were dug up after death, and were then symbolically beheaded or subjected to an execution ordeal, despite being dead already. It sounds bizarre, but that was something that had been used for centuries. Join us today as we look at the shocking posthumous executions of history, and remember to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Posthumous execution is a ceremonial mutilation of a dead body as a form of punishment. Many Christians were worried at the time about the resurrection of the dead, and that there was a belief that the whole body must be buried towards the east, so that the body could rise facing God. But dismembering it prevented the possibility of resurrection of an intact body, so posthumously executing a criminal was seen as a way of stopping them facing God. It was said that, in England, Henry VIII granted the annual right to the bodies of four hanged felons. Charles II later increased this to six. Dissection was now a recognised punishment, a fate worse than death, to be added to hanging for the worst offenders. The dissections performed on hanged felons were public. Indeed, part of the punishment was a delivery from hangman to surgeons at the gallows, following public execution, and later public exhibition of the open body itself. In 1752 an act was passed, allowing dissection of all murderers as an alternative to hanging in chains. This was a grisly fate, the tarred body being suspended in a cage until it fell to pieces. The object of this in dissection was to deny a grave. Dissection was described as a further terror and peculiar mark of infamy, and in no case whatsoever shall the body of any murderer be suffered to be buried. The rescue or attempted rescue of the corpse was punishable by transportation for seven years, but many people over the centuries were subjected to this. One of the first to undergo this ordeal was Pope Formosus, who was the Bishop of Rome for five years, from 891 until his death. After becoming the Pope, he was involved in disputes between the Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantine Emperors. He grew distrustful of the Roman Emperor, and he persuaded Arnulf of Corinthia to invade the Italian lands and liberate Italy from the, and liberate Italy from the Emperor. The campaign was successful, and the Roman Emperor died, which allowed Arnulf to take the Roman Empire. However, Formosus crowned him the new Emperor, whilst Guy III's son was in exile. Further military campaigns took place, but Formosus died, then after his death it was declared he needed to be punished for acting against Rome. He was placed on trial despite being dead for nine months, and the new Pope ordered his body to be dug up. It was decomposing, and it was clothed, and then his remains were propped up on a throne, in front of the court. He was stripped of his priest's vestments, and then, being found guilty of betraying Rome, he had three fingers off his right hand cut off, and then his body was thrown into the river Tiber. The posthumous trial would have been shocking with the Pope's remains actually brought to the courtroom before they were thrown into the river. John Wycliffe is considered one of the founding fathers of the Reformation, and as a man who criticised the Church. Acting against the Catholic Church decades before Martin Luther's Reformation, he defied the papacy, and believed that all Christians should rely on the Bible, rather than the teachings of the Pope and the clerics. He spoke out boldly against the clergy and the wealth and luxury that the Pope and the Cardinals were living in, and he disapproved of pilgrimages and many other things. He was a man who believed the Word of God was the only important thing, but his views gathered momentum and followers, but he also gathered a number of enemies. He died in 1384, but after this he was declared a heretic, and heretic trials came his way. He was found guilty of being a religious criminal, and the Council of Constance declared that his remains should be dug up from the churchyard where he was interred, and then burned. This is what happened, his bones were taken from the consecrated ground, and his corpse was then burned in a large fire nearby, and the ashes were then thrown into the River Swift, near to the town of Lutterworth. One of the most infamous figures in European history was Vlad the Impaler. 
the ruler of Wallachia who brutally executed many of his people by using his chosen method of impalement. After his assassination, the Ottomans cut his body into pieces and his head was sent to Mehmed II. It was eventually then placed on a high stake in Constantinople on display, but local tradition states his corpse was discovered in marshland by monks. Giles van Leidenberg was also subject to this in the 17th century. He was the Secretary of the State of Utrecht, and whilst in office he was arrested for causing unrest during the 12-year truce between the Dutch and the Spanish. He was worried about what would happen to him, and he feared execution, and because of this he took his own life. He hoped that this would stop the court proceedings against him, and that the state would not take his land and wealth. However, he was still convicted and was sentenced to death. His embalmed corpse was taken from its coffin, and it was strung up on a gibbet, and left hanging for 21 days. When it was cut down, a mob disinterred the corpse again, and then threw it in a ditch. The most famous series of posthumous executions came in England, following the restoration of the monarchy. Charles I had been executed by Parliament, but after his son Charles II was invited to take the throne, he went on a personal crusade to bring justice against those men who signed his father's death warrant. Because of this he launched the regicides, and many men who signed the king's execution notice were hunted, and many successfully managed to flee. But some including the most high-profile parliamentarians had died in the years before. Oliver Cromwell was the spearhead behind the civil war against the king, and he was a strong supporter of executing Charles I. But in the years following he had died, and he had been the Lord Protector, and had even been invited to take the crown. Charles II ordered the disinterring of Cromwell's body, and remains along with John Bradshaw, the judge of the court, and Henry Ireton, a military general, and Cromwell's son-in-law. All three were dug up from the ground. Cromwell, who had been buried in Westminster Abbey, did encounter a struggle when his body was dug out. The three corpses were gathered together and were taken to Tyburn, where they were then hanged in chains. In the afternoon after being dragged through the streets too, their decaying corpses were beheaded by an executioner, and Cromwell's head was placed on a 20-foot tall wooden spike above Westminster Hall, and it stayed there for 25 years. His head then passed through many hands in the following centuries. Blackbeard the English pirate, also known as Edward Thatch, was also posthumously executed. He was a fearsome pirate, and a scorn in the sides of many vessels. He was killed by sailors of HMS Pearl, who boarded his ship known as the Adventurer. Once his remains were identified, British First Lieutenant Robert Maynard had Blackbeard's remains then beheaded, and his head was tied to the bow spirit of his ship for the trip back. When they got to the home port of Hampton, his head was placed on a spike as a warning to other pirates. Even Rasputin's remains were posthumously executed after he was assassinated. His body was exhumed and then burned by a detachment of soldiers following the abdication of the Russian Tsar, and this was done to make sure his grave did not become a place of pilgrimage for supporters of the monarchy. So throughout the years there were many people who were posthumously executed. Many who had this inflicted upon them were made a spectacle of, and their remains were put on display to send a clear message to people to fall into line, and it was a very serious form of execution. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.